So before we open it up to questions and to having Ike talk about, about this, uh, I neglected to mention an important component of this year's Jazz Up Close uh, installment. Uh, this is the fourth of our four events in the <coughs> sound belief uh, compartment component. Uh, Sound Belief, the 2018 edition of Jazz Up Close, uh, <laughs> which, uh, in which we've explored different composers who use their faith as inspiration for music. And we've had a pretty amazing diversity of, of folks. And uh, one of the reasons I brought Ike here, and I think you will agree, is that um, we often, well, many of us experience instances in which people writing music from a Christian faith or from any faith really it's uh, sort of just for the converted and uh, I'm really amazed and fascinated to hear more about how Ike is able to make this so inclusive and make it spiritually uplifting for everybody regardless of their own spiritual practice so uh, um, do you want to talk either on a macro or micro level about the tune we just listened to oh such a pleasure to be here, first of all, and get to play for all of you. And I feel like if that was all we got to do, it was worth it was worth the trip. <laughs> get to play with these musicians and uh, and you know feel such a welcoming presence from all of you. Um, so I'm, I'm fortunate. I'm in a place called St. Peter's in New York that um, has had jazz there for many years, over 50 years now. And um, so we're we're part of. I've, I've walked into a tradition, a really deep tradition of a place that has had radically welcome policies in place for a really long time. So I continue to learn from that and you know, bring it into all our friendships and, and connections that we have. But actually, I think the, like the deepest connection when I was thinking about what you just said is um, uh, I grew up in a family that, that had different backgrounds. So my mom brought me to church when I was a kid. I grew up in a Lutheran church in Wisconsin. And because that's what you do when you're in Wisconsin. You <laughs> Packers <laughs> <laughs> and you go to Lutheran church. <laughs> But then, but my dad was a jazz musician and composer, and he didn't go to church. And, and he, um, it was funny, I, until a few years ago, I always thought of my mom as being the spiritual person because we went to church with mom, and my dad was not spiritual because he didn't go to church. And I think what I've, what I've come to understand is that it was actually sort of the opposite, and not to take any way, anything away from my mom's, um, all that she did for us, but I think I discounted all the spirituality that my dad had in his music and in his life, and and um, so I think in, as, a, as a kid, trying to uh, make sense of all that and feel like I want everyone in my family to belong, I want to belong, I want to feel like my dad belongs. And, and, and uh, so I think I've always really, I've had a really deep yearning for that. And um, so I think when I encounter people that are coming from a different place, and especially as I get older and, and go through trials and, and tribulations and, and uh, testing of faith and, and all the different experiences and you start to know people on a deeper level, you realize that we have so much in common um, no matter who it is. And um, so I think I, that just continues to grow the older I get and the more experiences I have. So um, yeah, connections like this are great. Get to share music. I think that's why live music is so critical because you come, come together and you experience this sort of communion of, of vibrations and music and, and being in the same room with people and you connect, you know, and uh, so I'm grateful for this today. Thank you. So tell us about Unending Season, the tune we just played. Right. Um, yeah, that's, it's interesting, I realized after we picked some of this music, even with it being a, you know, kind of a faith connection to this series, well, several of the songs that I have are, have lyrics, the one that we're about to play does. Um, but for me, I realized that I didn't even think about it until a ways into the process of which tunes I was going to play. I don't think of tunes as being sacred or secular, whether they have text or not. The, the tune we just played for me is a way to express a lot of feelings, the, the deepest feelings that I have. Um, so whether it has, it doesn't have lyrics actually, but for me, sometimes that has a way of conveying even more um, and being a little bit more boundless, you know, in terms of what you can express. Um, so it was, yeah, that was written a few years back, and I have an interesting association. Jesse and I have a, a project that's called Endless Field. It's a duo, guitar, bass, and um, that's the first song of our of our new album. And 
uh, my daughter, who's nine, always at bedtime every night, she likes to listen to a lot of crazy music, but every night at bedtime, she listens to Endless Field and plays it through her little speaker and cracks me up. And, but that, that song comes on, so when I hear it, everybody playing, it's like there's a lot of layers to that for me, so it's fun to be able to share that with you. Hopefully it doesn't make you sleepy. Uh, <laughs> that's it. Good excuse if you see me go out. But, um, but kind of in that spirit, there's a the next tune we're gonna play is a um, there's a dear friend of ours um, named Shanda Rule who's a great singer um, that we pl all played with a lot in the in the city in New York and um, and she just moved to Vienna, which is a total drag for us because she's so amazing. But. She, um, I asked her a few months back, we did a performance at, at St. Patrick's in the city, and um, they had a, a, we talked about some way to, to connect to the program, and it was a challenge because they said, your, your gig is gonna be in a year, what are you gonna write about? And I thought, I have no idea, I, don't, I haven't written the music yet. And I've always loved Psalm 19, which is the heavens declare the glory of God, and it's a very abstract, kind of wild, open psalm. And I just have always been attracted to it and always wanted to write something on it. So I called Shannon and I said, hey, would you write this poem based on that? Uh, I didn't want to set the actual psalm. I wanted her to kind of interpret it in her own way. And she said, yeah, I'll do it. And it you know, went on and on. And finally, as we got closer, she sent me this poem. She said, oh, is this OK? And you'll hear it. It's just this absolutely beautiful text. And um, so we, we put this together. This is a song uh, with text by Shanda Rule and music that I wrote that's called Wide and Free. And if you feel like singing at the end, we, we welcome you. <laughs> I know I, would, I probably won't.
much. So surely by this point someone has uh, come up with something they want to know, something they want to ask Ike or really any of the musicians on the stand. Yes, uh, Gary first. Um, I'm thinking all music is spiritual. Okay. <laughs> and some have evil spirits and <laughs> some have beautiful spirits. <laughs> I just wanted to know uh, how you how you quantify your music as spiritual. I mean, 
Good question. I don't know. I, I think when I've talked about this a few times, I, anybody should answer this, I guess. But for me, I think um, intention has part of it. So um, if it feels like something that uh, you're offering up in, in some sort of spiritual manner, I would agree with you. I think any, any musician I know that's really passionate about what they do, they offer up their music in a spiritual way. I think that's what communicates with other people. Um, I think that's how people, when people receive something in some kind of meaningful or powerful way, there's something being transmitted there, you know. So, yeah. so I don't know. I, I think it's, I think it's maybe a little redundant to say spiritual music. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I certainly agree with what you're saying about <laughs> intention. I find myself just in the last couple of weeks talking a lot with younger students about the, and this is not a judgmental difference, but just a sort of. Uh, difference of approach between music that is intended to be expressive and transcendent and music that is intended to be a commodity of some sort. You know, I mean, if, if I'm, I, I, this is not literally my job, but if it were my job to write a toothpaste jingle or something, then my intention would not be to transcend and express and connect with spirit, it would be to sell toothpaste. <laughs> and, uh, um, and there's a broad continuum. It's not, that, it's not that I couldn't try to express myself spiritually. <laughs> Well, and you know, there's plenty of things that get used for commercial purposes that were conceived from a more uh, personal and genuine uh, place. So I think, I guess I completely agree with Ike that uh, if the intention is to reach that place, then um, it's an expression of spirit. The, the challenging thing and something that I personally feel Ike and his colleagues are exceptionally good at doing is actually transmitting that in a way that it becomes a collective experience rather than a a purely, rather than something that's more, you know, I can, we can meditate or pray alone in a room and that's a genuine expression, but it's not one that necessarily uh, invites and connects, whereas the stuff does. Funny story with that, with the, the toothpaste commercial. One of my favorite tunes growing up was this Bill Evans tune called Comrade Conrad. It's a beautiful standard. It's like just amazing tune that really connected me. And it turns out he wrote it for a Colgate commercial. <laughs> I wish I could say I scripted that. Take this on the road. We had one. Oh, um, one more question back there. We'll make sure we get to all of them. Uh, yes, Gary. I just I was interested in the kind of bass you were just playing. There's a lot of bass for instruments. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so it's actually, it's, it's kind of, my, I'm on the edge because I just got this instrument a couple of days ago. I've never performed it till, till today. So, um, but, I, but I have, um, it's a, it's a five-string bass. It's an acoustic bass guitar. So I've been, for years I've been sort of chasing after, I actually realized I, I played a cruise ship about 20 years ago. And I remember strumming my bass guitar for hours, the same little four chords over and over, and trying to sort of get at this sound of, Basically, what Jesse sounds like. <laughs> I, I'm going to pay for that later. <laughs> I shouldn't say stuff like that. But um, but I love that sound, and I've always been searching for a way to sort of express when I'm writing. I, I have that sound in my head, and and so to, to translate that to the bass, I was excited to find this thing, and um, I use a, I use capos and all sorts of weird tunings to sort of get at um, the way that I'm writing, since I'm not a great piano player by any means. Um, I like to write on the instrument where I'm really comfortable, so it sort of opens up some new, new things on that. So. Yeah, but I play a lot. I like to sort of share the, you know, I play about half and half. I, you know, play a lot of each of these instruments, so just a lot to carry around though, you know. <laughs> um, is it okay if we play the next tune and then we, I've, I've cataloged the, the questions that are forthcoming. Um, Do you want to say anything about Turning Point right, before we play it? Turning Point, you know, I, I wish I remembered a little bit more exactly what the intention was with this tune. Um, but there was definitely, this, this was part of a project that was called Shelter of Trees um, that uh, Jesse and, and Dingman and Melissa were all a part of. And um, it was, my dad passed away about four years ago from colon cancer. And during that time when he was sick, somewhere in there, when I was struggling with, with some of that emotionally, 
this tune sort of came out and um, and um, that whole project was really, I, when I look back on it, it was really special. My dad was a musician also and, and I was able to record this piece as just sort of a, a little bit of a catharsis, you know, and, and actually get to share it with him. And um, and so it's, it's nice to be able to play this for all of you today. But this tune is called Turning Point. Thank you. 
back there. Uh, so the basis, I never seen a basis where uh, April, a little two. So I uh, was wondering where the idea came from. Actually, there's a, I, I originally saw there's a great bass player named Richard Bona that I saw doing a, a duo performance with Bobby McFerrin. And I, I heard the sound and I was like, what is happening? <laughs> what sound is that? I, I was so attracted to the way it, it sounded um, on, on the electric bass that I started messing around with it. And I've actually never seen it other than that one time. And since then, I've you know cooked up a lot of you know trial and error. Jesse and I are constantly. I ordered this little capo and she tried it last night. It totally didn't work. And I thought, oh, shoot, now I got to you know glue it or do some weird thing to it. So I'm constantly just experimenting with it to try to get some different sounds. You know, it keeps it keeps it fresh. So, yeah. but it's funny because we don't know sometimes what notes we're playing. <laughs> Jesse goes, hey, what, what note is that? And I go, Give me a couple minutes. And I'll play. <laughs> so it's like moving all. The, it's like switching the black and white notes on the piano or something. That's the Thank you. Uh, uh, Cheryl, did you have questions? This, this last piece kind of reminded me a little bit of the Ralph Towner Gary Burton collaboration. Wow. And um, but my question was on the last piece, um, your song. I was just wondering uh, if that was mostly arranged and how much of it was. Probably. Interesting question. Yeah, one goal I have. Some of the groups that I that I really admire have a way of concealing what's arranged and what's improvised. And the, the deeper the deeper they're playing, the way they're expressing themselves, they're connecting to the melodies and the things that are written in such a way that you can't really tell what's what's happening. So that's a hope that I have when we're creating this stuff to sort of blur those those lines. Um, but in this in this case, it actually is fairly. The melody is fairly written out, and um, but some of my favorite moments happen when when everything gets released from what's on the page, and you know there's a section where Melissa's singing and it's a whole note, and then she sings this other thing and it's just like that's that's <laughs> that's what was supposed to happen there, you know. <laughs> and, and, and so it's it's uh, everyone does that in their own way in the group. So a lot of times it, you're welcome. Any of you are welcome to come take a look at this stuff. It, it looks very much like what you'd see in a guitar lead sheet where you know, a song like uh, 
Moon River or something, and you see the, the lyrics and the melody and the chords, and maybe a little written piano part or something. But we're actually reading the same music. So I don't have, indi for this particular stuff, I don't have individual parts. I basically have a roadmap, and everyone's following that and, and contributing a lot of a lot of this, you know, in their own intuition. So, uh, so you have to select your band members carefully. <laughs> Do we have any other questions at this time? Okay. Well, I'm not going to complain because there's more music to play, and I'm eager to do so. But there will be more. To, we've got a few more tunes, which means a few more slots for questions. Did you come up with any? Um, Ike, do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, I would love to. This this tune is something that, that maybe the most recent song, of, uh, or one of the most recent songs that we that we were playing, and um, it's a song called "You Are." And um, this is something I dedicated to my buddy Chris, actually. And um, he was his dad passed away um, a few months ago now, and um, so he was. I felt like we had a lot to connect on, having having gone through that experience. And Chris is one of my best friends, so. Um, so I wrote this tune for him, and um, I don't write a lot of lyrics, so it's something that I've been challenging myself to do lately, is to try to sit down and, and write some text that comes to mind, and um, this one just sort of flowed very freely, and so uh, we'll share it with you now. This is called You Are. <laughs>
All right. I will open it up again if anyone. Yes. When you, uh, uh, like when you write music and you're writing vocals, whose voice do you hear? Uh, yours or Melissa's? <laughs> <laughs> My wife is also a great singer too, so she's she's in the mix there too. But I am. Um, I actually, it's a really good question. I, my voice does definitely not sound like Melissa's. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it sounds I think, pretty great. I think I, when I'm singing this stuff, I, I do have this, this sound. I'm so lucky to get to, to play with all these musicians, but I, I find that the way Melissa sings these, these lines, and just the sound, and it's just like, that's what I have in my head. So it's mm -hmm. so great to hear them realized in that way. It's incredible. I guess I have a question while we're waiting. So one thing that's uh, interesting about this configuration, which for there are many here who have been to uh, a lot, in some cases all, of these Jazz Up Close events. And the instrumentation is a bit different here. And uh, it's very, very chordal instrument heavy. And I'm, I'm curious while Ike is setting up to hear either Chris or Jesse talk about how playing in this environment and not only that, but Ike, as you can tell, plays a lot more stuff on on the bass than many bass players do. He's very uh, orchestrational in, in how he fleshes things out. So I'm curious if either of you wants to talk about what it's like playing in this environment, playing Ike's music, as compared with other situations where you might be the only chord playing instrument, or one of, let's say, only two. I'd say it's pretty rough. I'm going to say that this whole game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, one of the one of the interesting things. <laughs> I can get you back sometime. Yeah. <laughs> one of the interesting things about that question is sometimes I am the only chord instrument. Um, mm -hmm. I. You know, depending on the configuration, it's very good about, he'll make music with anyone. I, I remember uh, <clears throat> one time I wasn't maybe going to be able to make it to the to the gig of his, and he was so cool about it. He just said, oh, it's cool. Like, I could just play the whole thing solo or whatever. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not like you'd like, like, oh, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, like, he was just so like, flexible, I guess. Put it so, uh, so there's that. So sometimes I am the only chord instrument, and actually, on a lot of these pieces that we played today, um, I have been in the last few times we've done it. So it's actually been kind of an adjustment and an interesting one to then, you know, now we, we have more, more fleshed out. And uh, mainly, I just wanted you guys to go away, but I think, yeah. So I luckily can do, you know, play more of a more like horn player sometimes. Think of that way, um, or try to be an extension of what I'm hearing, which can be more tricky. But um, one thing that came to mind even today as we were maybe sound checking is it's kind of like the rainforest like there's so many sounds but every sound has its place so just trying to think of like where that place is for me and like what space am I taking out versus the other, the other players and like how the birds not really get in each other's way mm -hmm. <laughs> I just find that these musicians um, have a way of it's sort of like good relationships where you, if you're always looking out for the other person, then things have a way of working out. And each of these players, like a lot of times we'll get to a section like, oh, Jesse's about to solo, you know, this mind blowing solo coming up and it'll just look up and nod like, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, everybody does that. They're, they're assertive enough to know what's happening next, but everyone's really generous in the music and listening really carefully all the time. And, so it's such a cool model, I think, for, for me or for everybody, like it, it, as we go out into the world too, to think about like what what is what can music teach us about you know the way that we're treating each other and and uh, carrying along. So it's really it's a treat to get to play with these folks. So. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we're going to play a song that's may, maybe the newest song. This is just a, a month old or so. It's played it a couple times. And this was another example of trying to write a text. And I sat down on the train. I ride the Metro North train sometimes down in New York City. And, and just sat down with a little book and, and wrote out a text. And then, ha and then actually tried to write the music to the text, which is not something other than Shanna's tune that we played a little while ago. I don't normally do it in that way. Um, so this was a kind of a fun little experiment. Um, so this is a tune called What the Heart Desires. Chasing my innermost part I live for the unfulfilled dream In pursuit of the forgotten one
Thank you. I see a question over there. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering if you could just, it's hard to tease out all of the layers of sound, exactly what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> I feel like that's your idea. Jesse can't do it for a couple of reasons, and he. Um, so we have. We'll actually have um, Melissa and and Dana and myself and a sax, great saxophone player, and um, so it's it's a very sort of transparent version of like what we're doing right now. So I'll have to kind of dig in a little bit more on my foot percussion and on some of these chords because I have to kind of cover. Well, one thing I like about that group is they're. Um, when when I am playing all of these layers and this stuff, it's sort of a, there's a lot happening in the mix. So. It's, if you do have a lot of other things happening, drums and other things, it can get kind of obscured, um, which I don't mind a lot of the time, but um, I think it, that group has a transparency that allows it to sort of come through in a cool way. So, yeah. But the, everybody plays so, in such a tasteful way, even in this situation with three, I knew with these players it would totally work. You know, you could um, clone off them and have six of them and it would still work. So. <laughs> It would be scary for other reasons. Yeah, but, it would. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I definitely do not condone it. <laughs> yes? Uh, I have a question about, it seems like in your compositions, you're drawn to the feeling of three or triplets or... It's a really interesting is question. Is that just something that you just feel or you inspired by? Because to me it sounds like an inspiration for maybe a, a, some other world music yeah, yeah. When I was a kid, I got to hear a lot of really cool world music. My um, my dad had put on this concert called Earthworks, and it was, it's funny to think back at some of these experiences and think about what I'm doing now and how, how some of that stuff played into it. But um, yeah, I, I'm definitely affected a lot by that music, and I listen to a lot of music, you know, from different parts of Africa. Or, um, and Jesse and I actually have uh, that was sort of in a way how we, when we first started playing together, we played in a lot of jazz groups, but. Um, we started playing in, the, in this group that um, played some music from Zimbabwe and some other parts of Africa. And so we, we've always had, like, I felt like had that at the heart of some of our playing. But actually, on a practical level, it's something that is very comfortable with, for me when I'm playing these chords. And so it's actually a challenge for me to break out of that. That's why I laughed. I said to Noah, did, he, did you put her up to that? Because <laughs> he already said, boy, a lot of these tunes are in 12 A's. <laughs> uh, so, so it's something that I'm still working on, how to, to sort of mine as many different sounds out of this thing as that I can. And, um, but yeah, it's interesting that you picked that up. So uh, it's, it's just something I'm drawn to. In fact, you'll hear something similar in our last piece. So. <laughs> Yes, Scott. Of course, I'm curious about the percussion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Could you just play the different sounds so that we can hear yeah. the different yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is... Uh, so nobody can see them. Oh. No. Well, this is this a way. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is just a uh, pandeiro, actually, a Brazilian, you know, like tambourine. But I have it rigged up with a bass drum pedal. So it, it sort of sounds like a bass drum. And then you can... Well, actually, these are taped, but you know, I'm, I should be able to do something there. And then I've got this thing, which is basically did you just. Make that? I did make that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, it's basically like a bunch of BBs that are put in an electric socket. Oh, you made the. Oh, you made everything. So you can. It's like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, these are, you know, so you can, you know, you put that here, get a nice combination. 
patients. Sounds like a hi hat. What's that? Sounds like a hi hat. Like a hi hat, yeah. So we're we're kind of with our with our duo, we're always trying to think of ways to you know get different sounds. So this is sort of a, a work in progress. But I was just telling Ike, you know, I really need like a, a stand here with like some some little bells and some other sounds. You know? uh, yeah. He'll have a tuba and a thing. <laughs> I always have to, I'm like, I always evaluate, I'm like, eh, I think we can do that. Yeah, but yeah it's, it's cool. For the duo, it gives us a, a way to expand the sound a little bit. It's really yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. um, I should say a little bit something about that project are, are in this field group. Um, we've got a few CDs in the back if anybody's interested in some of this music. We've sort of been playing selections from different, from each of them. Um, but one of them, the newest one is this um, one, the green one that's back there called Endless Field. And if you open it up, you'll realize we're not trying to trick you. There's no CD inside of it. It's, a, it's um, as part of a label called Biophilia. Um, it's a really cool environmentally conscious label and so there's a download code in it with beautiful artwork from up in Acadia National Park um, but we do a lot of sort of outdoor uh, activism and a lot of uh, just you know projects outside we're planning to record an album outdoors next summer and um, so if you look at that album just be aware that it's just a download code <laughs> and just you know so you can find that on all the normal places but um, but there's some cool artwork to go along with it and um, so and and so, yeah, the last song that we'll play is something from that, uh, from that album. So. But before we get there, um, I actually had a question, but does anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Your, your questions are more important than mine, because I could ask them. Mm -hmm. um, well, I will ask mine then, which is actually a question for Melissa, if I may. Okay. Um, so because you are uh, such a prodigious singer of jazz standards and more, um, I want to say traditional material, because it's just different traditions, I suppose, but I'm, I'd be curious to hear you talk a little bit about differences and commonalities of approach in singing Ike's music versus what you would do if you were doing a typical jazz singer gig. Um, yeah, well, the, the longer I do it, the less difference there is, mm -hmm. it feels like. We, um, we played together the first time probably 10 or 12 years ago. Um, I've been here 13 years. Um, I'm from Toronto, I moved to New York, and um, got hooked up with these two, Jesse and Ike, and uh, we were playing mostly stand all standards, maybe a couple of tunes of mine. Um, and so that's how we started playing together, and then over the years, um, Ike invited me to, to come play at the church a few times as a band leader, and then eventually as a, a song leader at, at the church on Sundays for Jazz Fest first. Um, and that's when I started to play more of, of Ike's music, and really dig into it, and at first it was, um, it's still very challenging, but it was especially challenging at first because it was so different from anything I'd ever done, um, predominantly straight eight stuff, I mean I'd done some of that before, but rhythmically much more complicated than I was comfortable with, um, and harmonically different for me too, so it took a, took a lot of, of Ike nudging me and saying, you know, come on, you can do this. Um, and that there was so much freedom in, in what we do on Sundays at church and a lot of like getting people to sing and just kind of coming up with stuff in the moment that at first I was resistant to, but now I'm totally on board with. <laughs> and, uh, and that has affected the way I do my other thing too. Um, but I, as I said, I've come to see it less and less like two separate things, although I, some of you know me from my group Duchess, um, which is very different. For sure. Although we've all played together, and, and Jesse's actually in Duchess, so it's a, that's a very different different sound. <laughs> we don't we don't let him <laughs> we don't let him sing <laughs> yet. <laughs> but uh, but it's a, that's a great question. And um, my husband Jamie Reynolds, who's a wonderful piano player, we were just out on Long Island on Monday doing a, a workshop with some some students at LIU Post, talking mm -hmm. about swing versus the straight feel and how how really when things really swing and lock in they're not really da 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 they're not really swinging in that like quote unquote you know swung eighth note feel so much as like just grooving and how 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 much common ground there is and how it's really about the feel and the connection. So I really um, you know Chris was taking a solo and I was almost like snapping my fingers because it, I mean it, it's not swung but I feel like I feel like all good music swings that's what I that's what I'll say about that so I love this music and I'm really grateful to Ike for giving me the challenges that it presents because it's made me a better musician 
Yeah. Thank you. And I don't, I'm realizing I don't normally plug other gigs when doing this, but those of you who are in or apt to go to New York, I encourage you to check out every Sunday evening um, as part of Ike's Post at St. Peter's in New York. Uh, there is a Jazz Vespers, and, uh, and actually uh, the Jazz Samaritan Alliance, which is uh, a project that Chris and the saxophonist Chris Allen, um, who just left, uh, and, uh, and I uh, formed uh, back in 2012, uh, will be doing the music for Jazz Vespers next weekend, uh, November 4th. And, uh, and it occurs to me that all of the people in that band that night have participated in a jazz up close at one point. Uh, Chris, uh, those of you who came to hear Rogerio Boccato last year heard Chris playing saxophone with that. Uh, those of you who heard uh, the year before that, uh, Godwin Louis, the saxophonist, heard the drummer Alan Mednard with Godwin. And those of you who go all the way back to the first year of Jazz Up Close might remember the trumpet player Nadia Nordhaus. So we will all be, uh, who was our featured guest artist back in the fall of 2000, I can't count that far back, uh, a few years ago. Um, and uh, so, but it's a really, regardless of who's playing, Ike does an amazing job of both curating in the sense of choosing the artists to participate, but curating in terms of creating the energy and the overall community that, uh, that enriches it. Um, so it's a, a really profound experience that I encourage you to check out if you're ever in New York on a Sunday evening, especially next Sunday evening. But, um, um, and so uh, we'll finish off the, the commercial part of it, which is sort of ironic that we're pulling that in. Um, please do see Ike uh, about his compact discs and the biofolio that is not technically a compact disc, but is even better. Um, and. Um, and again, if there are any greenbacks to spare at the end of having bought all of Ike's music, then um, <laughs> RMI certainly appreciates your support of this series. Um, uh, and so, would you like to introduce this last tune? Yeah, I would love to. And, and I, also, thank you for saying that about St. Peter's. It's cool. It's, it's been, St. Peter's has given us a way, sort of a voice to be able to create a lot of this music. A lot of this is, these songs sort of arise out of, oh shoot, we have to come up with a, postlude for Sunday or whatever, and then I'll, I'll write one of these songs, or some, one, of, one of my friends will write a great song. And so um, it's a really special place. And um, if you aren't able to come on Sunday the 4th for Noah's thing, we do live, we just started live streaming it on Facebook. And so all through the year, it's every Sunday night at 6 o'clock. And it's, um, it's on, if you look up on Facebook, it's St. Peter's, all spelled out, um, S-A-I-N-T, St. Peter's N-Y-C. And uh, that, that's the church to look up, but it's, uh, yeah, they stream and then they, they, they live there for, for a while too. So if you want to, if you miss it and you want to see it after the fact, Noah, the, the group with Noah and Chris will be up there and Melissa will be singing and a lot of great folks. So there's a lot of music like this in a similar vein every, every week that happens. So we're pretty, pretty lucky. But I'd, I'd love to introduce um, these folks to you once again. This is my good friend, Jesse Lewis. On